All right, congratulations, you've made it this far, and I know you all have been waiting patiently to talk more about refugees, in particular how um, about refugees in Idaho. So we're going to go over this PowerPoint, it's actually a Prezi, that I created um, a couple years ago. I've updated it periodically. Um, this is what I give my in-class students, so hopefully this this is just as good as an online, um, but you don't get to ask questions of me, that's the only thing. So. In this presentation, we'll kind of go over what a refugee is, and you've already been doing a couple of different readings, so you should be a little bit familiar. We'll also talk about asylum and human rights. We'll talk about specific settlement, resettlement numbers and social transformations. This will be a part history lesson and a part cultural awareness lesson. As you've seen, refugees are people who have fled their home country or state is another way you can say that they've left their state. Um, they can't or won't return out of fear and um, there is a real fear of persecution, whether this persecution is based on their religion, what political opinion they may have, or if they're part of a social group, race, nationality, those kind of things. Um, the persecution is very key here. So refugees differ from migrants. Um, migrants might um, move to another country because it it's an economically smarter thing to do. Um, they kind of, they go with their head first. They think about, okay, I'm going to go to this country and I'm going to go work or I'm going to go to school or whatever. Um, so they're, they're really putting their head first into it. Whereas refugees, they flee with their body first and then their then their heart and mind come with it if that kind of makes sense so um, bottom line the persecution is the difference between a refugee and a, another like an economic migrant refugees are different from internally displaced persons um, the difference is is the people that are fleeing internally might be considered a refugee if they were le if they were to leave their state or country border. Um, usually IDP numbers are double that of refugees, so there's more internally displaced people than there are refugees. In a historical context, the humankind has always had refugees, but really it wasn't until World War II that the um, international community or United Nations really came together and did something about that. And what we're seeing here in these pictures are just thousands of people that fled. Um, a lot of Jewish, of course, um, Polish nationality, um, a lot of people fled during the war. The United Nations came together in 1943 and said, oh my goodness, look at all these people that we have um, displaced by World War II. So they created um, a resolution and it created the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency. Um, this was a three-year mandate. You, uh, one key thing is to know that the U.S. funded half the cost of this. And it was only supposed to be temporary, so hence why it was only for three years. And it really dealt with just big racial groups, so Jewish. Jewish, um, you know, maybe Jewish religion, uh, diff you know, different racial groups. In 1947, the international community came back together and said, oh gee, look, we still have these these people, these different groups that we need to resettle or do something with. And so in 1947, the International Refugee Organization was, was created. Um, it replaced the UNRRA. Again, it was only supposed to be for three years. But what's um, interesting about this is it, we started to, they started to change from um, broading, broad groups like racial groups or ethnic groups into individual eligibility. And this coincides really with what happened in 1948, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Seeking asylum is a human right. And we'll look at this a little bit closer. The process of becoming a refugee is not instantaneous. It proceeds through the often slow growth of root causes to the sometimes sudden flash of immediate catalyst that generates actual flight. Asylum follows when another state grants those in flight access to its territory, territory and extends protection to them. And this is right out of the 1948 Article 14 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
Everyone has a right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. This right may not be invoked in the case of prosecution genu genuinely arising from non-political crimes or from acts contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. So that 1947-1948, um, they really started to change, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, broad, broad-based, um, you know, groups of refugees to individual refugees seeking asylum. In 1951, um, again, they were like, oh, look, the, the Southern Mandate, you know, expired. They created the United High Commissioner for Refugees, which is UNHCR. This replaced the IRO, and this is still in continuation today. Um, the shift focused from country of origin to as well as country asylum. So what that means is where are you coming from and where are they going, basically, the country of asylum, who is giving, um, what countries are giving asylum to refugees. Um, the UNHCR, um, we've looked at it briefly um, in this class already, um, but they, um, their basic functions include um, the protection of refugees. So actually that's their number one um, mandate is to protect refugees. Um, they do that by working through um, with non-governmental organizations and providing basic needs. So food, housing, um, shelter, security, um, non-governmental organizations or NGOs. Um, some examples would be like World Relief um, and there's other there's a ton of them that are overseas helping um, helping the cause of refugees. Um, they do monitor what's going on worldwide, um, so they are prepared to act um, if they need to. If there's large movement of people outside of countries, they are um, prepared to act. Um, one thing that you see them, UNHCR, um, primarily dealing with is setting up refugee camps. Now refugee camps will differ depending on where the refugee location is. The camps can range from 10,000 to half a million people. Um, again, depending on the region, it could be an actual physical building, could be tents or something more um, rustic um, with, you know, makeshift camps. Um, they do um, prepare meals, um, have have food available, and we're talking very minimal foods, um, minimum subsidence, susti sustenance, <laughs> if I can't say that word. Um, refugee camps are meant to be temporary, but unfortunately what we've seen over the last, um, you know, 20, 30 years is some refugees are living in these camps for upwards of 12, 20 years, um, depending on where they're at. So here's some photos. Um, this one is in South Sudan. As you can see, the UNHCR um, has provided tents for these people, um, probably also those yellow water buckets that you're seeing. Um, this one's a little bit more recent. This is from um, Syria, um, Syrian refugees. If I had to guess, this was probably in Turkey, but I do not know for sure. Um, and here's another South Sudan refugee camp. This one's a little bit more um, primitive, as you can see, more makeshift. Um, uh, this could be internally displaced people as well, actually, now that I'm looking at this. So one thing to remember, or probably the most, um, the largest, the most important thing here is refugee camps are meant to be temporary. Um, UNHCR, their very first, um, what they would really like to see first is repatriation. And repatriation means um, for these people that have fled their country to go back as soon as possible, as soon as it's safe, as soon as they're no longer um, in fear of being persecuted. Um, the next, you know, if that's not going to happen anytime soon, the next thing they look at is local integration. And we can see that successfully happen. Um, occasionally, um, that happened, you know, 20 years, 20, 30 years ago um, with the Balkan crisis, um, maybe some local integration up in Germany. Um, you know, they, they, they allowed Bosnians to integrate up there. Um, but the third thing that I think a lot of people think about is um, resettlement to a third country. And that's generally the last um, solution that they look to um, if the first and second don't work out is the lastly is a resettlement to the third country. So 
looking at the United States involvement, um, United States, as you saw, took a very large part in the initial creation of um, refugee agencies with the United Nations. And the U.S. really got involved for four different reasons. Um, initially, anti-communism. We, we didn't want the spread of communism. Um, we didn't want to spread communism. So um, that was one reason why we got involved. Um, we also have gotten involved historically with refugees and places in which we had a part in their instability. So think of Vietnam, think of Iraq, think of Afghanistan. Um, we had a very real um, cause to the instability and so hence we're, we're doing, um, trying to do something about it for the people um, that are affected in those regions. Um, we also want to take our fair share in the international community. Um, Western states are um, Western countries in in Europe are our other um, resettlement um, countries as well as Australia um, and Canada. Um, so we want to take our fair share of um, refugees and we also do this for humanitarian reasons which is kind of hard to believe lately but um, you know we're you know we're not bad people we want to we want to help where we can. Um, looking back, you know, if you want to think about the history of the United States, the United States, we're, we're a country of immigrants. And if, if you think about the pilgrims, when um, the Native Americans, when they first saw the Native Americans, you know, Native Americans were like, come, welcome, there's room for us all. We will help you until you can take care of yourselves. I mean, really, when we take in refugees, that's really what we're doing is we're carrying on on that tradition, how we, unless you're a Native American, I guarantee you, you know, your family at some point came over as immigrants. Um, throughout this last year, um, this is um, just a snippet from October 2014 to August 2015. Um, this is where refugees were resettled. Um, Montana, Wyoming, you can see here, they don't have any. 766, that, actual, that number is actually a little bit more after I updated this um, Prezi. Um, let's see, Oregon 864, 6,000 and some odd in Texas. Um, you know, any surprising numbers in there? Probably not. Um, for a little old Idaho, um, 768, that's not too bad. So why Idaho? Um, well, it's pretty cheap to live here. We have smaller cities like Twin Falls and Boise. Um, for the most part, you know, we are a welcoming community and there is a short proximity between housing and jobs. Um, Idaho arrivals historically in the 1980s you saw, you know, Romanians, um, Soviet Union, Viet Vietnamese, Cambodians, um, refugees set resettle here. In the 1990s we had a huge resettlement um, with Bosnians um, and some other European countries. What I'm primarily going to focus on here is what we've had um, more recent from 2012 through 2000. Um, I should update that. That's actually through 2015. Um, so we'll kind of go over the top. Um, I think I did top 10 that have been resettled here. Um, so what we're looking at is just different regions. Um, Myanmar or Burma, we've had about 1,600 relocate since 2002. Um, I will give you access to this power or this Prezi so you can go back through and read different these different things on your own if you wanted to. But um, if you ever hear if you ever hear people that, um, saying they're Karen, um, not Karen, they're Karen. Um, that is most that's who we've mostly resettled here. I've actually got a student in my face to face, two of them that are Karen. Um, um, Burmese uh, that are in my class. Um, Bhutan, we've relocated about 1,300. Um, you know, if they say they're from Nepal, um, that's that's where they're from. Um, Afghanistan, um, which is pretty striking, you know, 592 relocated here, which is 6% of the U.S. total. That's a big chunk for, um, you know, looking nationwide. Um, I, I've 
I know quite a few that have attended CWI or are currently going to CWI, um, several women um, who are um, single with children um, or maybe you know, uh, widowed would be probably more appropriate, and um, also families, and um, uh, they either speak Farsi or Dari, um, and I suspect we'll see more numbers over the next years with, with Afghanistan. Russia, um, not very many, um, but you'll still see, um, you'll still meet some Russians here in Idaho that have been relocated. Uzbekistan, um, again, not very many people overall, 224, but 8% of the U.S. total, that's quite a bit. Um, they've been here for, for most of them, been here for a while, so they're more integrated. So I would probably say they've been here about six, seven years for the most part. Iran, very, very few out of the total U.S. population, about 304. Um, uh, I've I've known a couple here at CWI. Iraq, I suspect we'll see this number increase. Um, this one's kind of a given um, with what happened in Iraq um, back in 2003. Um, about 1,300. Um, one thing I do want to point out, which is very, um, you know, interesting. Um, about 104,000 Iraqis have been resettled, 32% Sunni, 23% Shia, and 22% Christian. There is a large Christian population um, of Iraqis. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, I think a lot of people get hung up on religions when they talk about refugees. Um, and um, so just pointing that out. Sudan, we've had um, about 253 relocate here. Um, if you've ever heard of Darfur, um, that could be a region where they're coming to us from. Um, it could also be South Sudan as well. Eritrean, um, we have about 261. There was a really good Eritrean restaurant that was in the international market that burned down. I think they've set up shop elsewhere, um, but really good food just FYI. <laughs> Somalia, we've had about 957 resettled to us. Somali Bantu, um, that's probably a term that you might hear within this class. Burundi, um, not very many, um, not very many, and I want to say I've only, I've only met a couple of people from Burundi right next to Rwanda, um, if you've heard of Rwanda, I'm sure. And then Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC is another way to say that. I suspect we'll see more numbers from this as well. Um, there's a civil war going on right now there. So um, I will give you access to this so you can go through and look through each of these a little bit closer in detail. Um, but historically, um, or within the last, um, you know, 12, 14 years, and that's where the resettlement, where refugees are coming from resettling to Idaho. Um, what's to come 2015 on? Well, um, it's hard to say. Each year the President, in consultation with Congress, determines the numerical ceiling for refugee emissions for fiscal year 2016. Um, the proposed ceiling is 85,000. Um, so fiscal year runs for the government October through October. Um, so you can see on this chart, um, fiscal year um, 2015 was 70,000. And um, the ceiling and actual admitted, that's where they're at. Um, I think uh, we're operating under the 2016 fiscal year right now. Um, so a lot of people think that, whoops, let me go this way. A lot of people think that we're going to see a huge influx of um, 10,000, you know, Syrian refugees this next year. I don't know that we will because usually there is a delay. Um, we do have Syrian refugees in the United States and we do have Syrian refugees in Idaho. Um, I want to say either a hundred to three hundred people or families, um, probably about 300 family or people. Um, but there's a, a vetting process. Uh, I know you've heard that on the news. 
people are in a pipeline right now that maybe maybe Syrians that have been in Turkey or other places um, two, three years ago were finally coming to the United States. The ones that we just seen on the news in the last six months over the last year, we will not start processing those kind of resettlement numbers, I suspect, um, for another couple of years. So when when President Obama said we will accept 10,000 Syrian refugees next year, okay, um, but it's not the ones that we have been watching on the news leaving Syria, you know, just yesterday. It'll be the ones that have been in the pipeline for a while. And you'll learn more about that process as we go on. So just kind of re recapping, looking at Idaho, um, about um, over 10,000 refugees have been resettled, resettled here um, in the last 13 years or so. Um, about 75% of those numbers go to Boise, and about 25% of them go to Twin Falls. Um, there is a resettlement group at the College of Southern Idaho. They're actually the resettling agency um, at Twin Falls. and. Um, I, if you're local here to Idaho, you've probably heard some from some talks and opposition in regards to that. So just kind of looking over, you know, right after September 11th um, in 2001, you'll see this huge drop in numbers, um, but and then it starts creeping up um, quite a quite a surge here in 2009. And I just pulled this number. Um, in total, we had 961 resettled um, last year in, in Idaho. Um, Boise per capita has one of the highest number of refugees. And when I say per capita, um, the that's given the total amount of the population to the, or uh, other area, um, to whatever. So per capita, you know, like other, other, you know, cities, you know, um, what is the one in Tennessee that I can't think of right near Nashville, they have a lot more people than we do. So their per capita in, um, is lower. Um, so Boise actually has a pretty high per capita. So as you'll discover further in this class, um, you know, re refugees come here, begin a brand new life and in a new country, um, they will all experience some sort of social transformation. You know, kind of putting yourself in their shoes. The language may be different. Um, dietary, like what they ate initially, maybe thinking about, you know, the African um, refugees, you know, they lived off of, you know, the, the, the land there and maybe they, they ate yams and um, rice and, and they get here and their dietary, you know, the, the, the food is completely different. Um, education is totally different and sometimes, you know, what wasn't even available to them is finally available. Um, different occupations are available or no longer available and we'll look at that you know if they were trained overseas and they come here with high levels of education and credentials sometimes they're not able to um, to work in that field and it's um, housing is certainly different you know coming from you know Africa maybe they were living in very rustic mud huts which you know that works, you know, in, in that land environment for here, obviously that's, you know, we're, we're talking about just different housing, um, different values and different things. This social transformation has one end purpose in mind, integration. So integration, integrating into um, the local community, integrating into the state, the nation, and this is opposed to what? Segregation. So we really want those social changes to occur educationally, culturally, value, you know, they still need to keep their, their, their own identity, but also they need to integrate into our, our communities. So some things to think about when you're talking about all refugees. Then the first thing is they had no choice. If you asked any one of them right now, you know, where they would like to be, they probably would want to be back on their own land, the same land that their ancestors farmed, um, their own um, city town or whatever they grew up in, um, without the war that came through or whatever it is. They had no choice. They did not choose 
the life of a refugee to be resettled um, as as their third option. They they really didn't. Know. That's that's one thing that all refugees have in in similarity. The second thing is all of them experience some sort of trauma. Um, this trauma could be you know just um, the fear of having your school bombed or um, having family members killed or anything. Even the um, the experience of just fleeing. Um, maybe that city or state or whatever. So those are the two similarities that all refugees have. Beyond that, every refugee is a person. They come to us from different regions. They come to us with different cultural values. Um, but by and large, those are the only two similarities. Um, and then the rest is just, you know, individual changes. So in closing, um, Remember that compassion is a verb that, um, you know, the education that you're learning here, the, um, the experiences, um, of the different refugees that you're going to encounter, um, you know, in, in these lessons, when you go out into the community, um, and you happen to see someone that looks different than you, whether they're refugee or not, but remember compassion is a verb and sometimes all that takes is is just maybe just a smile. Um, maybe when you two are sharing the same lane at Winco bagging, for instance, which has happened many times to me. Um, so um, we'll continue to explore um, refugees and um, uh, what they contribute to the community and some of the challenges they um, you know, they face when they first come here and um, everything as the weeks go on. This world is getting colder, strangers passing by. Mm -hmm. No one offers you a shoulder, no one looks you in the eye. Ah, ah. But I've been looking at you for a long time. Trying to break through, trying to make you mine Everybody wants to flame, they don't want to get burned Well, today is our turn Days like these lead to Nights like this lead to Love like ours, you like the spark in my One that starts, starts the spark in our bonfire